My name is Sebastian Riedel, and I'm going to talk a bit about a diet for your templates, which means you have a template library, it blows up your executable and you want it to get smaller. What can you do? So, a few words about me. I work for Tioco, it's a telecommunications company. I work in the Vienna office. I've been a C++ programmer for about 18 years and I'm the maintainer of Boost Property Tree. Um, so, the background of, for this talk is that I created a dependency injection library for our work. Um, we needed that for a project and it has a lot of runtime flexibility. So you can configure it all in runtime. It all uses templates internally but uh, completely erases the types. Um, so it generates a lot of code internally and it supports separate compilation and there will be a dedicated presentation for this library tomorrow. I hope to open sources. So with all these templates, we had the problem that in debug builds, where you add debug information, we actually had the linker die from out of memory errors. It was the 32-bit Microsoft linker. When we switched to the 64-bit linker, it worked, but it took forever. How, so, how much memory did you get? Um, so the inputs totaled about a, a gigabyte. Yeah, I, and mean, it, I mean how much memory the linker itself needed. Well, it crashed when it reached two gigs. Uh, the question is, was how much memory did the linker need? So it, I think the 64-bit used somewhere around three to four gigabytes of memory. Okay, I'm, I'm asking just because at work we have a project that requires 10 gigabytes. <laughs> okay, so the question was because <laughs> he has a project that needs 10 gigabytes of RAM to link. Well, <clears throat> we wanted it to be faster than that. Um, so, <coughs> here are a few words about IOC++. So let's say you have an interface that has some virtual functions and you have a class that implements the interface. And then you have some classes that have dependencies on that. Well, here's how you use the IOC++ library. You create a container. As you can see, it's not a template. You configure it with some reflection information about the library where you tell it, okay, I have a type B, and its constructor has one argument of type int that, is, that I call I, and the class provides the interface A. And then I have a type C that has constructor arguments, and it wants an object of type A, and the argument is called A, and the same thing for D. And then I configure the object graph where I say, okay, so if I want an object of type B without a name, I can say, well, then the, the parameter I should have the value A, and I have a named object of type B2, and the parameter has the, na has the value 2, and then I can say, okay, give me an object of type C, and it will say, okay, so I need an A. I know that B provides A, so I'll look for the unnamed object of type a in that case and it knows oh there's the B I'll create that and inject that and so I get a shared pointer to C out and the C refers to a B and that B has the value 1 for its I member and the reflection information part is the part that generates a lot of code because it needs to generate all the code that says here's how you create the object here's how you convert it to the resulting type and all of this needs to be completely erased um, so what I did was I measured the size of a few files. Um, so libutil.lib is uh, our compiled utility, utility library. It's all static libraries. And it contains the actual source code of the, of the IOC++ library amongst other utility stuff. And then I had one test file. This is a unit test file, the biggest unit test file of IOC++. So I compiled that, looked how long does it take to compile, how much how big is the object file, and that allowed me a uh, fast iteration on, on trying things out because I didn't have to wait until the actual, our actual program, the valoxlib.lib, compiled, which, and this li library is about 850 megabytes at the time we had the problems. Um, so there's debug information included because that's the build that crashed, the re release build didn't have that problem. Uh, there's lots of code in those libraries that is not related to the IOC++ library itself, but um, so, so the, the, 
I can say, well, this reduced the size by 5%. I can say it reduced the veloxlib.lib size, but I don't know how much of that is actually IOC++ generated code. And the other thing was that while I was optimizing this, the other people added code, new functionality. The, I had to optimize the speed of the library, so it went up and down the size. I basically tried to keep up with new developments and trying to keep the linker from crashing. So here are the things that I did. First, avoid complex templates. There are some templates that, are, that generate lots of code, and sometimes you can replace them with something simpler. simpler. Uh, we'll see an example of that. Um, you can factor out type-independent code from your templates. So lots of templates, despite being templates, lots of code in them is often not really dependent on the argument types to the template, and you can factor out that code. Sometimes you can only factor it out if you do some runtime polymorphism if for instead. It can be worth it. That's your call, basically, but that's an option. Um, you can explicitly instantiate templates. This doesn't usually reduce your final executable size because the linker will fold multiple instantiations together, but if it instead of instantiating the template once per object file, that's a lot of code that linker has to deal with. If you can instead instantiate it once for the entire project, that saves you time and memory. And the final thing that I will show you is that algorithmic improvements to the way you do things, in that case, in, to the way your template library works, is still, of course, the most effective thing. Just like with runtime optimization, where an algorithmic improvement will usually trump every micro optimization you do. If you can improve something like this, you will get orders of magnitude better resu results usually. Um, so let's start with this. std function. If you instantiate std function, that generates a lot of code. So I don't know who was at the practical performance practices or talk yesterday. Uh, he said something similar. It was for him, it was for performance, for me it is for object code size. std function generates a lot of code, and he replaced it by just, well, here's a concrete function. I just capture the lambda in an auto. I can't do that, I actually need the dynamic dispatch, but there's um, a simpler way to do it sometimes. If you don't have it user facing and don't need that flexibility, you can just say, well, I just make a small interface that has one virtual function, and it does the same thing, and it's much less work for the compiler. So let's give an example from the IOC++ library. <coughs> I have <coughs> um, a lifestyle manager. Um, in the Boost DI library, this, a lifestyle is called a scope. This is basically, well, if someone wants an object, do I hand out a new object every time, or do I have one object that I give to everyone, or is there some different way of doing that? Uh, there is a user extension point here, so the user can implement his own lifestyles, like maybe a session lifestyle where for every user session in a web application there is one object, or maybe for every re request. And this is, um, this lifestyle manager used to look like this. There's a lifestyle manager interface. The user has to implement this. Um, and he has to implement this virtual function, and this virtual function is basically it says, well, give me a pointer to a cached object if you want to do that, or if you want to create a new object, if it's your decision to create a new object, then use this std function to get one from the container. And this is a std function, and it returns a shared pointer to void. And at this point, the veloxlib.lib was 870 megabytes large. So what I did was I said, well, I can do this. I just make a tiny struct. It has one virtual function. It has the same signature as the std function. And I pass this instead. I pass it by mutable reference for internal reasons. And so if the user wants the object, a new object, then he just calls creator.create instead of calling the creator as a function. And on the other side, this is the user of this interface. This is the library code that uses this user extension point. 
and it says, well, here is um, this this lifestyle provider use, uh, passes this function object as the std function to the to the virtual function to the user provided function, and what this does is it says, well, if you call me, then I'll remember that I was used, and then I ask the internal machinery of the li of the container to create actually create a new object and I return this and if an exception happens here I add some trace information that an exception happened during object creation for debugging help and that's it I, I return the object and so this was given to the std function and I basically replace this with this object which is very similar it now inherits the it implements the interface this is no longer an operator a function call operator it's create function and I put some I put the was used as a bool inside instead of capturing something from the outside not much difference in code a side effect is that because this object is too big usually for a Sud function small buffer optimization, the sud function would allocate it on the heap. Yes? Orthogonal question. Yes. Why was a bool pointer in the last slide? So, um, just out of curiosity. Because uh, the question is why is this bool here a pointer and now it's a member variable? <coughs> um, can I answer this once I've shown the usage? Yeah. I think I have. No, I don't have. I don't have the usage on the slide. Okay, so in in this version, the caller had a local variable of type bool and passed the point into this. The reason is that if you assign the, an object of this type to std function, the std function makes a copy. It copies the function object, and if this was a local state, there is no way I can re I can access that local state. So I have to copy the pointer and. Uh, so that I can assign to the local variable of the of the inside function. It's basically like a by reference lambda capture. Originally, this was a lambda, but I factored it out because it was too big. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. So and and here I actually create this object on the stack, and then just pass the, pass it by reference to the function, which means I save the malloc from the function, and I can access the state. So there's less malloc traffic. And I did this, and basically the Velox slip went from 870 megabytes to 857 megabytes. And I did another optimization along the same lines where I replaced std function by a uh, custom interface, and it saved another 40 megabytes in the Velox slip. So Based on my guess, what the ratio of actual IOC++ code in the library was, that's about 10% savings. Any questions about this? Was, how much of that is a function of the compiler itself, though? Like, did you do cross-platform like GCC? We don't do cross-platform. Uh, the question is, how much is this cross-platform? So the answer is, yeah, I should have said it before. We're a pure Microsoft shop. We use Visual Studio 2013 at that time. We, la later, we now use 2015. So all of this is only Microsoft the library as it is only compiles with the Microsoft compiler and the Intel compiler. Um, so I don't know the effect on GCC or Clang. It also depends on your standard library, of course. Right. Yes. Uh, you switched from a call operator to a named create function. Was that important, or what? 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 Uh, what caused that? that um, I switched from a call operator to a named function. The reason is that I kind of think it's weird if the call operator is a pure virtual function. All right. So then there is no particular reason. I could have made the call operator the virtual function and done that, or maybe made the call operator a non-virtual function that calls a virtual function. Um, right. I just did it this way because that's the way I'm used to interfaces. Uh, small bu uh, what does SBO mean? It's a small buffer optimization. So usually a std function implementation has an internal buffer that, so that if the function object is small, it can 
put it in that internal buffer instead of having to go to the heap to make space for the type erasure object. All right, moving on. Another small complex template thing was basically lack of knowledge on my part. So I have this class, it's called a multi-type provider, and it basically, this is the thing that says, well, here I have a type B, and it implements interfaces I1, I2, and I3, <coughs> and this thing knows how to, create a, how to create a B, and how to convert that to one of the interfaces. And it does that by, well, inheriting from many converting providers that know how to convert from B to their particular interface. So for each interface that it provides, I have one converting provider, base class. And I have this weird template machinery that does recursive template instantiation so that it can enumerate all the base classes. And at one point I realized, hey, actually, pattern expansion, like this. Okay, that doesn't work on the screen. Um, pattern expansion works in a base class list. And that saved four megabytes. It's not much, but it makes the code simpler, and it's a saving, so great. So interesting to know, pattern expansion works in the base class list, so you can inherit from many base classes at once. All right, detemplatize all the things. So this is basically if some code doesn't depend on the parameters, there's no reason to have the compiler duplicated. Um, of course, sometimes your templates are written in a way that it is not trivial, so you may have to refactor your code a bit. Let me show you another example of that. Here is the function that says, well, I am creating an object, and the constructor wants some value argument, like um, int, and I need to find out what value was configured for this, for this argument. <coughs> So what I do is, well, I start a try-catch block, and I have some internal function that does the main job, and when it's done, I tell the debugging and tracing graphing system that, hey, I'm just done cre uh, resolving an argument, and I have success, I've succeeded. Or if an exception happens, then I add some tracing information, like I was currently creating this, I was currently trying to get a value for this argument, while an exception ha happens so that I can give the user a nice backtrace, and then I rethrow the exception. The resolve value argument function itself does, well, it tries to get some value that is a boost in a, stored in a boost any. Pretty much everything in IC++ is stored in boost any's. And then I ask the <coughs> main machinery to say, well, this boost any is currently, I don't know, maybe a string, and I really need an integer, so try to convert that. And at the end, I extract from the any the resulting value. So I know that this any cast will succeed, because if if it wouldn't, then that would mean that any doesn't contain a t, but this function guarantees that the any at the end contains a t, so it actually modifies, it modifies this argument, this is an in-out argument, and the post condition of the function is that this is a t, and if not, it throws an exception. And the value c basically says, well, tell me in the configuration of this object, is there a value for this argument configured? And if there is not, then maybe the argument has a default value already configured in the reflection information and return that. Um, so the interesting thing about this is that since this is all boost any, even get default value returns a boost any. And well, this is all boost any. So what, what parts actually depend on this t? Of these three functions, the parts that actually depend on t are this any cast and this type id. That's not a lot. And by the way, this value argument template looks like this. Um, it inherits from the non-template class dependency argument that provides this get dependency name function. This returns a string, so 
nothing dependent on t there. It has this boost any, and it has a function that returns that, and it has a function that can be used to set it. That's, that's all this class does, and as you see, can see, well, this doesn't have much that depends on t either. There's a type def up there, and there's this defaults to function. The rest, well, I can extract that <coughs> to a base class. I can inject a new base class in between, so this one holds the any, um, and then this part is no longer dependent on the template, it will no longer get duplicated. The actual value argument now derives from value argument base and just contains the things that depend on t. <coughs> and now that I have this value argument base that actually is a non-template and already provides everything that the functions need, that those function templates need, well, I can refactor re these. Get value seed can take a value argument base, then it no longer needs to be a template because get dependency name and get default value, they don't depend on t. Resolve value argument, I can extract a core function out of that that doesn't depend by simply passing in the type info instead of doing a type ID of t inside and returning a boost any. Um, nothing in there depends on t. Resolve value argument doesn't really depend on t anymore. If I pass in the type info, now I can do all this try catch stuff uh, in a non-template, which is great because try catch generates exception tables and usually generates a lot of code. And it returns a boost any. And the actual template function is tiny. It just causes, passes in the type ID and does the any cast. So there is a tiny small change in functionality here. If the anycast now throws, it's outside the try catch. But I know that it will never throw because it's the wrong type. It can only throw if the copy or move constructor of t throws. And I'm OK with that not being traced the same way. Because those catches don't actually catch any error and handles them. It just gives some more information. Um, I have two more functions for that for different kinds of arguments and this in, in result it saved 14 megabytes in the veloxlib.lib, reduced it by a nice chunk. It added something in libutil.lib because well now I have non-template code and all the non-template code goes in libutil.lib. But this is good, this is where I want the code. And that was nice. Any questions about that? Yes? Did you notice any performance impact one direction or the other in these changes? I did not do very careful performance measurements at any point of this because it was mostly, f uh, the question was did I notice any performance impact? So the compiler performance increased, uh, so compile time got better. Runtime performance, I have no idea, especially because I was only measuring debug builds all the time. And this is not a performance sensitive part for us because the whole project is a non-interactive project uh, program. The user starts it, then he goes away for an hour. And basically this is mostly used during startup of, of that process. And so I don't really care if it takes one second or five seconds to start up, who cares? It's gonna take an hour or five hours to run and performance is not really an issue for us there. We did some performance optimizations at some point but this was basically focused on, on size and compile times. Um, right, so I had the cumulative change. Any more questions? All right. So sometimes <coughs> you cannot do it like this. Um, it's not that easy. Sometimes you have to say, well, I can make this a non-template, but there are some parts left that need polymorphism and it, I need maybe a virtual function in there, well, maybe it's worth it. In this case, you just have to do the refactoring, see maybe what's the performance impact, what is the size impact, and see if you think it's worth it. And actually, as we learned yesterday, smaller code is faster code, so maybe by doing that, the size reduction, the cache, the cache behavior improvement might actually make up for that virtual function call. Uh, 
So here's a big function. It's not that important what it does. Basically, what it does is if you create an object, there is an option in IC++ to say, well, I want every object that is created of this type to be wrapped in another object that implements the same interface to do the decorator pattern, like a logging component. Every time this interface created, I inject a component that logs the calls and then forwards. So this function does that. Big template functions. And if you look at it, again, there's <coughs> just very few places that depend on this t. I get in a shared pointer to t. I use type ID of t here to find something. This is just a map lookup. And it gives me <coughs> all of this is not dependent on t. And there is one place that is dependent on t. And this is this object from provider call, which says, well, I have a provider, like this multi-type provider earlier, give me, let it, make it instantiate an object. Um, and so this is two places that depend on t in this large func function. How can I refactor this? I cannot extract most of this because at this point I do depend on t. But I can extract a lot of it. This is the non-template part. So I pass in the type info. So I can call find decorators with that. I don't need t anymore there. <coughs> All of this is not dependent except for this part. But what I can do is I can make here, I can use shared pointers to void instead of shared pointers to t. Aliasing shared pointers are a great thing. So it remembers the delete, that it deletes correctly, and I can use a static pointer cast to get back to the type that I know is in there. And that's what I do. So instead of this object from provider, I now have this from provider. This is another little interface, and it just says, well, give me a new object and return it at a shared pointer to void. I know that what's really in there is a shared pointer to t. But for the purpose of this wrapping, for this loop, I don't need this type information at this point. And this is what remains of decorate, right? I have this interface from provider. It has this get function. Um, it returns a shared pointer to void. I have the decorate function. In there, I have a local class that implements this interface. And it does this by, well, it calls object from provider t of t, and that returns a shared pointer to t, and it's implicitly converted to a short shared pointer to void. And the main function consists of, well, give me the type id of t, pass that along to the function, instantiate a local type from provider object, pass that to the function, and do a static pointer cast on the result, because I know that the result shared pointer of, of void really points to a t. I know that this is safe. Um, the gains were modest of this refactoring. So 1.2 megabytes in the Velox lib, which is not a lot. It's one virtual call, but decorator. So the virtual call is, this virtual call is in a loop. But the common case in my application is that there are no decorators. So most of the time, this function will get to here and return. This, will, this is usually true, this condition. So most of the time, I pay no performance penalty for the virtual call. And I have reduced code a little. I have extracted common code, so it might increase, cache, increase uh, the caching success uh, hit rate. So overall, I, I still think this is an improvement. And I did a similar refactoring where I paid more cost. It cost, it cost me three virtual calls and I, uh, dynamic crosscast, which is more expensive. I could have traded the dynamic crosscast for just <coughs> grabbing that reference to that thing earlier and storing it. And that saved four megabytes. It's not much, but it just kept me ahead of the other developers adding and adding and adding code. So. I left that in. <coughs>
Any more questions about that? Okay. Third technique. Yeah. Actually, were you using link time optimization during all of this? Uh, was I using link time optimization? No, because I was doing debug builds. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, in link time optimization, the compiler usually generates even more stuff because it generates not object code. Uh, the compiler generates not object code, but um, uh, an intermediate form that is usually bigger than object code because it needs to contain more information so that the optimizer can still do useful things. Basically, the, I would expect that the, then the, the linker can do some optimization and shrink the code size at the mm. But of course, that doesn't apply here. So, the comment from Luis was if I'm doing link time optimization, the linker can reduce code size, add link time. Yes, it can actually reduce code size, add link time, even if I don't do link time optimization because it can fold identical instantiations of templates. The problem is that our problem was too, the link times were too long. So saying, well, the linker can optimize it is, well, it's not what we were looking for. And yes, the final executables were actually not that big. That w All of this, what I did, had very little effect on the actual co final code size, but it had a big effect on the link times. And for the debug fast iteration of, you know, build, rebuild, rebuild, that was very important. All right. Explicitly instantiate templates. So you've always been able to say, well, I want this template instantiation to be done explicitly and placed inside one source file. And that was nice, but I never used this in C++ 98 because there was no way to tell the compiler, oh, and by the way, I am explicitly instantiating this thing. Um, don't do it yourself. Don't do it implicitly. The only thing you could do was, well, I could hide all the definitions of the template member functions from the compiler, and then I can explicitly instantiate it. But that's not usually what you want in a template library, because usually you want the template library to work for all types. So you, the compiler needs the definitions available so that it can instantiate them. But for some types that are used very often, I want to do it explicitly and not have the compiler repeat the work all the time. And that was not possible in C++ 98. There were compiler extensions. And C++ 11 basically made one of these compiler extensions official. And that's the extern template declaration that basically says, well, if you see a std vector of int, don't try to instantiate that. I'm going to do it myself in some source file. And so just expect the definitions to be available. Marshall? Just a usage example. C++ does that for basic string. It has two instantiations in the, in the dynamic library for care and w care. Yeah, so Marshall, Marshall pointed out libc++, for example, instantiates the std basic string template with care and white care and care 16 and 32 too, maybe? No? Okay, so those not um, yeah. So those two are instantiated in the lib in the libc++ library already. So the the user programs don't need to do it again because obviously everyone uses the string and not the basic string of my own character type. So this is totally worth it. As far as I know, the Microsoft standard library you at least used to do it too for the string. They usually do it for I/O stream too. For the for the common instantiations, what's the question? Does this, does this affect um, the compiler's ability to inline? Does this affect the compiler's ability to inline? I'll get to that. Um, so this can be really worth it. Um, here's how IOC++ did that. Um, we have this functionality that we say, okay, so I have, the user has given me the command, well, I want the object foo. I have a named object foo, give me that object. So what it does is, how do I get from the string foo to an object? And it internally holds a conversion graph, a graph of possible conversions. And in there says, well, if you want a object of type foo, you first need to find a configuration 
of how to instantiate that object. And if you want that configuration, well, you can use a string to look one up. Uh, so I have this graph, and I do basically do a search of the node that says, hey, I have a string, to the node sa that says, I have a foo. And then I, the edges of this graph are the are functions that do the conversion. Like the function that is associated with the edge from string to configuration of an object of type foo does a map lookup. It looks in a map that has stored all the configured objects for the object called foo, and it gives you the, back the object configuration. And the function that gets from a configuration to an actual object does the actual instantiation. And this graph component itself is, of course, a template. So it's a template that has a template parameter for the vertex and one for the edge. And the thing is, I always use the same vertex type and the same edge type. This is independent of the actual type of object instantiated. It's one graph for the entire, uh, inst for the entire uh, dependency conta uh, injection container. And this means that I don't need this graph to be repeatedly instantiated in every source file that uses my container. But that's what the compiler does. Um, this looks like this. So this is one, these two are the template components that are external components. Well, I still wrote them and they're part of libutil, but they're not really part of IOC++. And well, type conversion is basically a wrapper around Pathfinder. And it says, well, I'm using a Pathfinder and the vertex is a type index object that says, well, this, is, this node represents this, represents this type, and the edge is a std function. That takes a boost any to be modified. It takes a conversion status, which can tell, well, this conversion failed because I couldn't find any co object configuration by this name. And it takes some extra arguments that are passed along to the function that provide more context. And then the actual container uses exactly two instantiations of those. Namely, one is a type conversion where the extra arguments are just a resolution context, and one where I have the resolution context, some conversion options, and a callback that is used to cache some results. So these are the two type conversion types that are used. And this type conversion class is actually has a lot of code because it has a lot of code that says, well, I found a path to convert, now try that out. If it works, there may be multiple ways of getting from type A to type B. Um, try all of them in order. If one fails, store the exception. If all the paths fail, then take the shortest path and for that path try to generate a long error description that exactly says, okay, I tried to get from a string to this object configuration, but I couldn't find this name. So that's actually quite a bit of code. And so what I did was, well, I don't want to instantiate those every time. So I added some extern template declarations for type conversion. I also did it for Pathfinder. Unfortunately, this means that some implementation details of type conversion leak out into the container because I know, have to know that internally it's going to use this Pathfinder. I'm not 100% sure that this is necessary, but I did it. And then in one source file, I just copy pasted this code and added this template and, and, and remove the extern so that in this source file, this is where they actually get instantiated. Um, anyone want to guess how much code size this saved? Marshall? No, I just say a lot. Marshall says a lot. Any other guesses? The answer is none, nothing. It was the same size as before. And the reason for that comes back to the earlier question about inlining. So 
you, usually everyone writes the templates, you say template, class, blah, 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 and then you have member functions and you define these member functions in line because if you don't, then you have to repeat the template argument list and you have to say, and this is a member of this cl class template with this long argument list and nobody likes to repeat himself this way that much and we still don't have template namespaces. So, <sighs> once you do that, the compiler says, well, you know, you told me not to instantiate that template, but you also told me to inline that function because you defined it inline. So I'm going to instantiate that anyway, just so maybe I can inline it. Uh, well, the function is huge, but you know, that's not my business. That's the optimizer's business. So this saved nothing until I outlined member functions like this. This is what it looks like. Here I have this function inline, and this is what it looks like after refactoring. So I have just a declaration here, and I have to repeat everything here so that it's out of line. It's still in the header file, of course, but it's not in the class. And now, well, I saved 23 megabytes. And libutil grew by 1.5 megabytes, which shows, yeah, that's about right. So if I multiply this, this growth in libutil, by the times, by the number of source files in Velox that included the IOC++ container, that is about right. So that was a nice saving. Any questions about this? All right. So by this time, if I look at the history, if I look at my document where documented all the savings, I found out, okay, I reduce the code size that I generate by maybe guess 20% and veloxlib.lib at the end was pretty much the same size as before because, of course, everyone else kept adding new functionality <coughs> and adding new objects registered in the container. So while I was reducing the per object overhead, <coughs> well, there were more objects. And at this time, I talked about it with a colleague and we said, well, I'm doing one thing wrong. There is actually a really stupid thing I was doing. Let's look back at this reflection information. So I have all this functionality that says, well, if the user asks for an object of type T, how do I instantiate that? How do I convert to that? And that's actually a lot of code that just provides this conversion functionality. And I did it for every single type that I registered. So type B, type A, type C, D, E, all of these generated code and code and code. And here's the funny thing, none of this code is needed. The code that I need is how do I get an E and for the sake of these, this argument here, how do I get an A? I don't need to know how to get a B, a C, a D. I don't need that. I, I, I need to say, okay, if I want an A, then I need to know how to instantiate a B or C, but I don't need to know all the final, you know, get this out to the user. And so what I did was, well, I refactored the code so that it wouldn't generate this information. So instead, before, before I said, well, if I register a type, then generate this information for this type and every interface it provides. And then I refactored the code so that I say, well, no, don't do that. Actually, whenever you see an object argument, generate the code for this thing. And when you see a container.resolve, generate the code for this thing. And that's enough. And well, when I did that, the veloxlib.lib dropped from 840 megabytes to 490. It completely blew away every other saving I had done so far. And basically, that's, what, that's the point when I stopped optimizing because, well, we were clear out of, out of the danger zone of about 800 megabytes, so I was done. Lessons learned. Uh, first, optimizing templates is similar to optimizing runtime. So you do something, you measure, you try again. The main problem is that 
by now I think there are template profilers based on Clang. My code didn't compile with Clang. So it was basically, well, let me guess where the performance problem or the template size problem is. Try this, find out it doesn't help anything, throw it away, try something else. What I don't have in this talk is all the things that I threw away because I can't remember what they were because I never committed them to the repository. Um, if you can think of a way to do some fundamental improvement, th try to think of that first. It's usually much better than micro-optimizations. Just like with runtime optimization, try to think, well, can I reduce this algorithm from n squared to n log n? If you can do that, awesome. Um, if you are forced to do the actual um, op uh, micro-optimization of template code, try to separate argument-dependent and independent code so that it doesn't get duplicated. Even if the linker can deduplicate the code, which it cannot always do, it still means less work. Um, and even if you say, well, I don't actually want um, a compiled part of my library, if it's a header-only library, it can still be worth it to say, well, extract the non-template code out, make it inline, because different template instantiations, the, comp the linker may be able to fold these, if it can prove that you don't rely anywhere on those different instantiations having different function pointer addresses. Because that's actually something the standard guarantees, that two functions, function pointers to those two functions, don't compare equal. And this means that even if two, if two instantiations of a function template have identical code, the linker cannot fold them unless it can prove that you never rely on their addresses being identical. On the other hand, if it's a non-template inline function, the linker can fold it, no problem. It doesn't need to prove anything. It just says, well, that's the same function, throw one away. Um, so even for header-only library, this can be worth it. I think you should measure. Um, explicitly instantiating templates helps a lot, but only if you define the member function outline, out of line. If all the member functions of your class templates are defined inline, then it doesn't do anything. And the final lesson learned is std function is very nice for the user because, you know, it's just, you assign anything to it and you can call it, but if you don't need that flexibility, maybe don't use it because it generates a lot of code. Matt? Sebastian, did you try um doing your own type erasure, that is accepting a template um, callable and then, you know, uh, putting it somewhere else. Did I try to do my own type erasure? You mean instead of std function? Yes. Um, so you, what you did is you defined an interface yeah. and you implemented the interface so as to do the virtual function dispatch. Mm -hmm. That's a very like nice. taking a sub, making a subclass which accepts a template callable and so forth. Um, so the question is, did I instead of, did I try instead of doing this with an, a new interface, did I try to just make my own type erasure thing that kind of works like std function but is simpler because it doesn't need a delete or anything? I did not. Um, in this case, because this was mostly not user visible, it was just it's, it's not much overhead to just define the special purpose interface and it's much much harder I think to define a type erasure it's not that much work either but in this case I think I think the simpler solution is just the obvious and simple one and I, I don't see the need okay. for a fixed signature for a fixed signature yeah. could, it wouldn't be that much more code to uh, have a templated subclass. Yeah, it, it wouldn't be that much more code to have a templated subclass. That's true. And in, I mean, in, technically, if you if you look at this, this is technically a templated subclass of this interface because it's 
well, a local class inside a template <coughs> function. All right, um, that's it. Any questions? Yes. I'm pretty sure I already know the answer to this question, but you can't use extern templates in a header only library. There's no way that could gain anything. <coughs> so the question is you can't use extern template in a header only library. That's correct. Because if you do an extern template, there has to be some source file where you do a uh, non-extern template, uh, an explicit template instantiation. And you, can, you can't put those in a header because those explicitly instantiated templates are not marked for folding, so the linker will complain about multiple definitions. Okay. Um, what you can do in theory is you could, in a header-only library, provide a header that contains um, extern template declarations and another that contains the explicit uh, definitions and say to the user, well, I'm a header-only library, but you can improve your, co if you are not header-only, you could improve your uh, compile time by including that header with the extern template declarations everywhere and have one dedicated source files to include the explicit instantiations. And then have those in just that file. You could do that if you write a header-only library and you expect the user to mostly use your header only thing with these particular arguments. Uh, another? Yeah. Just image. We actually use that technique for our spirit grammars when we build a room to apply it. Okay. And this is their compile time makes them happier. Mm -hmm. but what we wrote obviously is happy. Yeah. So what Michael says is he actually uses this technique of providing these specific special headers when he writes for clients a specific grammar that needs some instantiations, but what he does is mostly header only, and so the cl client is then happy because he can use these headers to reduce his compile times. Cool. Any more? Okay, then, thank you.